This program was produced by the Chemical Heritage Foundation. Our mission is to collect, preserve, and make known the history of chemistry, chemical engineering, and related sciences and technologies. Behind the most important factors that shape our lives every day, there lies a revolution about which few of us know. In the first half of the 20th century, innovators combined electronics with chemistry to make new measuring instruments. In the hands of important researchers, these electronic chemical instruments changed our world. Electronic chemical instruments have extended our senses into the world of minuscule molecules, into the chemical domain. These instruments form our eyes for this world. They allow us to look closely at what materials are, how they behave, and how they're put together. Instruments are also our hands in this domain, allowing us to pull existing molecules apart and put entirely new materials together. At the start of this instrumentation revolution, stood a crucial scientist entrepreneur, Arnold O. Beckman. Well, I'm probably a little biased, but I can think of no more field, a field no more fascinating than that of electronics, instrumentation, and automation. The, uh, these fields offer the same sorts of frontiers which our forefathers had in the geographical frontier. This is the story of Arnold O. Beckman, chemist, inventor, businessman, and philanthropist. His is a wholly American story about a very curious boy possessed with pluck and luck, a young man who embraced risk, adventure, and passion, and a grown man who shared his passion for science and invention with the world. Oh, I think everybody's curious. Oh, yes, there's nothing more curious than a young child. Arnold Orville Beckman was born on April 10, 1900, in Cullum, Illinois, a small farming town. His father worked as a blacksmith, a maker of everything from hand tools to horseshoes, a vitally important member of any farming community. Cullum in the 1900s had little to offer in terms of organized activities or entertainments for its children. For Arnold, the town became an education in invention. In Cullum, he said, we were forced to improvise. I think it was a very good thing. He developed a fascination with building things, using cast-offs from around town in his father's blacksmith's shop. And when he was not tinkering, he was reading. When he was nine years old, Arnold discovered a book and fell quickly under its spell. Oh, I happened to find a book in the attic, still 14 weeks in chemistry. It belonged to an aunt of mine. And that was printed in 1871, I think. At that time, chemistry was not a very involved uh, science. And the book was mainly on how to carry out experiments using chemicals that are available around the house, salt and salt soda and things like that. So I got hooked on chemistry. His dad helped him set up a little lab out in the shed where he could do experiments that he claimed were pretty easy to do and kind of liked it. Uh, he thought chemistry was really cool and he could do it. Arnold scrounged for needed chemical supplies everywhere, from the pantry to the local druggist. During his youth, electrification was taking place around the globe. With it, electrical lighting and equipment came into workplaces and houses. Arnold scavenged materials for his own electrical experiments and tinkerings. Entrepreneurship came early for Arnold. In high school, he not only had his own dance band and a regular job playing piano for silent movies, but also started up his own chemistry consultancy. He was soon performing chemical tests for the local gas company. World War I was at its bloody heights when Arnold graduated from high school, and he immediately enlisted in the Marines. 
Just days after his arrival at the Brooklyn Navy Yard to ship out, the armistice was signed and the war ended. While stationed in Brooklyn, Arnold met Mabel Menser, a volunteer with the Red Cross. The chance meeting was the spark that started their life journey together. Beckman returned to Illinois determined to become a chemist. In four short years, he earned a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Illinois in its leading chemistry department. He then set out for the West and a PhD in chemistry at the California Institute of Technology, Caltech. Early, I think that the <coughs> attraction of the state of California as such played a role. I was young and curious to see what this fabled land was, was like. At Caltech, Arnold started experiments combining chemistry with electrical measurements to plumb the newest scientific understandings of matter and working with some of the top chemists of the age. Finally, Arnold was at an institution that had the facilities and teachers that challenged his incredible curiosity. He loved his studies, and the professors at Caltech admired the promising student. But something pulled Arnold away from his work. He could not forget Mabel Menser. Arnold made a choice. He took a leave from Caltech and headed back to Brooklyn, to Mabel. He was pining for Mabel, and, uh, and he needed some money, so he managed to get a job at Bell Labs in New York so he could go back and make a little money uh, and see Mabel. He got to Bell Labs, and they taught him at Bell Labs about vacuum tubes and electronics and what was going on in electronics in the 1920s. In the 1920s, Bell Labs was already a premier industrial laboratory for electronics and communications, the research center for the telephone giant AT&T. Specifically, Bell Labs led in the technology of the vacuum tube. As a fast switch and powerful amplifier, the vacuum tube was a breakthrough that started the modern era of electronics. Everything from long-distance phone calls to radio broadcasting owed its existence to the tube. Arnold became steeped in vacuum tube electronics at Bell Labs. As his professional life took off, his personal life blossomed as well. On June 10, 1925, Arnold and Mabel were married. But Caltech still wanted Arnold, and its leading chemist urged him to return to finish his Ph.D. And by that time, I was getting oh, nostalgia for the smell of the chemistry lab, and uh, I agreed I, I did want to get my degree anyway. This request, and the thought of once again heading west, appealed to the adventurous young couple. Arnold and Mabel set out for Pasadena in the fall of 1926. Their six-week trek across the country was punctuated by 19 flat tires on their Model T Ford. What he did in his PhD, he built some really beautiful instruments, really beautiful detectors. Then he got this job at Caltech. They kept him on. He was invaluable. They made him a faculty member. Arnold became an assistant professor at Caltech, just as the stock market crash of 1929 opened the Great Depression. But soon, a new opportunity walked through his laboratory door. It had to do with the way chemists measure acidity, pH. Now let's join our success story reporter, Ken Peters, as he chats with founder and president of Beckman Instruments, Dr. Arnold O. Beckman. Well, Dr. Beckman, after seeing all of these amazing operations, I can't help but wonder how an organization like this ever got started. Well, we got started very casually uh, just 20 years ago, Ken. I was teaching chemistry at Caltech when a, uh, an undergraduate uh, friend of mine came in and told me his troubles. Glenn Joseph, who had been a an undergraduate with at the University of Illinois, uh, was now a chemist at Sunkist, the Fruit Exchange, which is a cooperative here in Southern California, later Sunkist. And he had this problem in measuring um, the pH of byproducts from lemon juice, pectin and citric acid. Normal, inexpensive ways such as litmus paper wouldn't work. So I uh, built an electronic amplifier for him to help him out of his troubles. He came back in two or three months and wanted to know whether I wouldn't build him another one because someone else was always using the first one. I decided that was enough to start a business. Arnold's solution to the problem was to use powerful electronics to create a robust and widely useful pH meter. This tiny voltage is amplified and finally is read out on a meter, the scale of which is calibrated directly in terms of pH. Integrated into a single portable instrument, 
His pH meter put the power to get rapid, accurate measurements of this fundamental chemical state into the hands of any user. One thing led to another, and he and Mrs. Beckman went on a trip uh, saying, you know, let's go across the country and figure out how many of these instruments we might be able to sell if I could build them. And they went across the country and they said, well, I can probably sell about three or 400 of these instruments. And so let me, I'm, I'm going to start making them. So he set up a little shop in Pasadena, which you can still go to. It's in the 3400 block of Colorado. There's a little spot there. And he set up a little shop there, and he started building instruments, and uh, and he started selling them. <laughs> they started selling like hotcakes, and he couldn't build them fast enough. Based on the popularity and success of the pH meter, Arnold founded National Technical Laboratories in 1935. We were not very much business oriented in our thinking. We were just could we make the instrument and uh, put it on the market. We were babes in the woods so far as the the business world was concerned. When I think of the discoveries that have been made in medicine and uh, like that, and uh, most of them use uh, Beckman instruments, not only the page meter, but say the most important one has probably been the uh, spectrophotometer. That opened up a whole new era of being able to analyze organic materials. Molecules and materials have chemical fingerprints. Specific materials absorb particular colors of light, or more generally, particular wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. The pattern of this absorption is distinctive for a given material. It is the molecule's chemical fingerprint. For decades before Arnold Beckman, experts had painstakingly produced these fingerprints, capturing them on photographic plates. But in the 1930s, Arnold and others saw that new instruments could be made to find these fingerprints using electronics. They named these new electronic chemical instruments spectrophotometers. Around 1940-41, he, he put together this spectrophotometer, the Beckman DU, that just revolutionized uh, chemistry and biology because when people could make these measurements and figure out, you know, there are these kinds of atomic units in this structure because they have certain characteristic light absorption. They absorb light in certain regions with certain intensities. Everybody was, they were falling all over themselves now to buy the Beckman DU and turn those knobs and figure out what, what, the, what these compounds they had, what, what were in their compounds. And there were a lot of really important compounds like vitamins and all kinds of medically important compounds that people wanted to know what the units were in them and, and how to manipulate them. And Dr. Beckman Instruments, his DU told him that. During the Second World War, the DU was used for the breakthrough antibiotic penicillin and for the production of aviation fuel and high explosives. After the war, Arnold and other instrument makers kept up the pace of innovation. They crafted new spectrophotometers and other electronic chemical instruments that gave researchers expanded access to the molecular world. But the fun, the harder thing is in the technical aspects. I know I have to have this thing be financially successful, but uh, that's for the controller and I've got to worry about. I'm concerned more about solving a technical problem, coming up with something that's useful for the advancement of science. As his activities grew, Arnold expanded the company, eventually taking it public in the 1950s as Beckman Instruments. Beckman Precision Instruments play a large part in America's tremendous chemical industry. In its shops and laboratories and among its people, we find a purpose that seems to typify the industrial and scientific spirit of America. From the very start, Arnold's company pursued innovative electronic products as well as chemical instruments. Always inventive, Arnold designed an improved control for his pH meter. This component, called the helipot, proved vital to the development of radar and launched Beckman Instruments as a maker of electronic products. By the late 1950s, Beckman Instruments emerged as a major U.S. producer of electronic computers. We were into a lot of different things. And historically, Dr. Beckman, uh, because of his interest, that, in, that intellect and interest and 
sort of never losing that sort of boyish look into science and what does this mean or what does that mean. So we were into things like air pollution, we were into semiconductors, we were into liquid crystal displays when they first came out, gas displays. We were in the space program. Clearly, when the big decision was made, probably in the late 60s and early 70s, to move from a basic scientific instrumentation company to into clinical instrumentation, which was the real thrust of the growth of Beckman in the 70s. It all came from that early work being done using the technology from a pH meter on down. Really, it was an exciting time, it really was. Arnold was extremely interested in the emerging world of electronic computers. In the mid-1950s, he formed a partnership with William Shockley, who had been key to the invention of the transistor, the next step in electronics from the vacuum tube. Together, they created the Shockley Semiconductor Laboratories, the first silicon electronics organization in what became Silicon Valley. In the 1950s and into the 1970s, Arnold championed the use of electronic chemical instrumentation to tackle one of the greatest challenges to society of that era, air pollution, namely smog. Smog threatened to choke the health and vitality of Southern California. In leadership roles in the business community, Arnold championed the use of new instruments to determine the causes of smog and to combat them. And we built instruments to measure exactly what was in there, and there's nitrogen oxides, and we figured out how they were made, and it was also as ozone and things like that. And so in, instruments made all those measurements, and they quantified the amount of ozone and the amount of nitrous and nitrogen oxides, the amount of NOx, if you like, and figured all that out and figured out where it was coming from and figured out how you could mitigate it. You could mitigate it by making a catalytic converter, and so that when the gases come out hot, they got they get they get converted to, to, to inert types of materials that don't crud up the air. And the whole environmental thing was, 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 was driven by instruments that made measurements of what was in the environment and what was polluting the environment and what we could do about it. So there, there's a, just a total connection with the instrumentation revolution with our being able to improve the environment. And the environment in L.A. was improved by people using instruments. The successful efforts in California set the stage for the protection of air quality in the U.S. and around the world. As scientists increasingly viewed the processes of health and life as chemical processes, instrument makers like Arnold Beckman developed an expanding range of electronic chemical instruments for medical use. All of these instruments that uh, Dr. Beckman developed from uh, the mid 1930s to about 1950 or 55, you see in various forms in hospitals and doctors' offices and in scientific laboratories, and universities, everywhere you go. It's hard to go in a room in a, in a laboratory, in a chemistry laboratory, in any university and not see something that had its origins uh, in, in, in an Arnold Beckman instrument. There were two eras of biochemistry, and one of them we call pre-Beckman, and the second one we call post-Beckman. In 1981, Beckman Instruments merged with SmithKline Corporation, the huge pharmaceutical company. The new corporation became known as SmithKline Beckman. In the late 1980s, Beckman Instruments emerged as an independent company. Then, in the late 1990s, it became Beckman Coulter, maintaining its leadership in diagnostics and life sciences instrumentation. With each of these transformations, Arnold's personal wealth grew tremendously. Just happened that our company was successful and uh, accumulated uh, substantially more money than I needed to take care of my living expenses. And uh, <clears throat> what are you going to do with it? I thought, here, this money was was uh, accumulated by selling instruments to scientists. Let's give the money back to scientists. That's where it came from. They're, they should have the first priority on it. And so the number one uh, guideline has been that it should be for advanced research 
in the field of science and especially in the bioscience related fields. Dr. Beckman had a very, the very, very strong feeling that it was all technology and instrumentation driving science. That was it. He really wanted us to develop new technology, new instruments, new methods to drive science, and he wanted to do it, he wants to do it in a collaborative way across disciplines to get engineers and physicists and chemists and biologists together to develop new methods and new instruments that would drive the individual scientists. He wanted us to get to the point where chemistry and biology had the big high-tech stuff that would drive the science the way astronomy had been driven by instruments. He and Mabel had, um, you know, very clear uh, aspirations and discussions about where their money would go. But even though he was giving what at that time were mega gifts of, of uh, 20 to 40 million dollars, um, every time he turned around, his portfolio had replaced that money and had grown. So he was faced with a real dilemma. And then Mabel died in, in 1989, in June of 1989. I think she was a sounding board. Um, I think she was his best friend. Uh, she certainly brought a lot of stability, I think, to his life because he was, you can imagine, this brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man going all over the country. Um, and she, but she was with him. You know, they traveled across the country with their pH meter to, to determine, you know, if there was any use for it. And, you know, she was right there by his side. It's really a beautiful love story. Arnold and Mabel had planned to distribute their wealth together. Without Mabel, Arnold faced some difficult choices about his philanthropy. He decided that he could not responsibly give back his fortune to science, technology, and medicine in his lifetime, so he made the Arnold and Mabel Beckman Foundation permanent to carry out their work into the future. Arnold O. Beckman died in 2004 at the age of 104. Well, his legacy is, his legacy is really the instrumentation revolution. Somehow, he was just born with an incredible curiosity about how things work. I mean, I think he was always from day one trying to figure out how things worked and what he could build that was better and even in his last days, he would be fiddling to build something in his house, <laughs> some gadget he was building that, uh, that he thought would work better than something somebody else had built that he just bought. <laughs> he was a real tinker, and, uh, and, and that, was, that was Dr. Beckman. He was just curious about everything. He wanted to know how everything worked.